Hi everyone, welcome to a brand new episode of the Behold Podcast on the Genre Equality Channel. I'm Hitzer. I'm Isa. Uh, and this episode, we're going to be talking about the sort of evolution of, of modern documentary comedies. Mm. Uh, Docu comedies is sort of an unusual genre that isn't really done often, but I'm sure many of you are, are familiar with the format because of one. Sasha Baron Cohen. Mm. Um, we got to, before we talk about all the new shows. We got to talk about, I guess, the king of the genre. He may not have invented <laughs> it, but yeah. he popularized it with you know, in secondary school. I'm sure you and your friends, much like me and my friends, were introduced to a little show called The Ali G Show, mm -hmm. uh, where he introduced three characters: Ali G, who is kind of this um, full streetwise poser. Yeah. Um, he introduced a Kazakh reporter named. Borat, uh, and a gay Austrian fashion enthusiast named uh, Bruno. Uh, <laughs> since then, of course, Ali G, Borat, and Bruno have spun off into their own Hollywood features, with, which has made um, Sasha Baron Cohen such uh, a celebrity. Uh, basically, mm -hmm. a transcendent celebrity that went beyond his UK roots, you know. Um, did, did, did you watch the Ali G show back in the day? Yeah, I mean, like, <clears throat> back in the day, it was a little bit more difficult. I think that was kind of like, just before YouTube started and all that. So getting your hands on the Ali G show uh, was a little bit more difficult. Kazaa, um, man. I got it via Kazaa. Yeah, so similarly, yeah. I had to go and like download or like um, there were a couple of guys who were just like downloading stuff and burning it onto VCDs and like just passing it out. Yeah. Um, so that's how we got it back then, right? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I, I, did, I did watch that. Um, yeah, and like it, it kind of became a mainstay for for anyone, you know, like a uh, interesting way for pop culture to spread prior to the advent of YouTube and and memes mm. back then, right? Definitely, I mean, if, if memes were around back then, Ali G would certainly have been at the center of it, lah. Or yeah. Ali G's characters, lah. The the characters that spun off from his shows. Yeah. Um, little did I know, watching it in secondary school, you know, with the pirated VCDs and downloading via Napster and Kazaa, right? That it will become such a big kind of cultural phenomenon in the 2000s and in the yeah. 2010s because, mm -hmm. you know, obviously Borat 2 just came out. You know, it, it, was, it was a big thing last year, uh, the subsequent movie film. Um, and it introduced this whole new genre of, of, of storytelling that yeah. I didn't know existed, a documentary and a comedy where you are playing a character, the, the protagonist or, or, or the host is a character, yeah. but the people who he's interacting with are just normal, unsuspecting people. Yeah, some of them are celebrities uh, or some of them are high-ranking high government <laughs> officials who may or may not be trying to sleep with someone. Yeah. But, but you know, like, the, the reactions elicited, the issues uh, explored are real and genuine. Mm -hmm. uh, what an interesting way to to uh, get some human insight in and uh, through unsuspecting subjects. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um do you, did you think like, you know, um after the Ali G show came out, like, you know, well did you think like why aren't there more shows like this? Or do you think that, you know, it required a special kind of person like such a Baron Cohen to make these kind of shows work? Uh I mean Okay, given the three topics that we're talking about today, I, I think you don't need necessarily to be as over the top as as Borat or Bruno. Correct. Or it's Ali, yeah. Ali G, right? Yeah. Like sure, playing a character um like that def definitely I, okay, I think for its time, like when those characters came out, right, on the Ali G show, uh yeah. it was very in line with what people wanted for that time in terms of the humor that they were looking for. Provocative, uh, edgy, yeah. Mm, yeah. And I, I think that uh I, I'm not sure. I mean, Borat 2 was still very popular last year. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't know if that necessarily is the trend going forward, mm -hmm. right? Uh, with with the way that comedy is right now. So when we're talking about like co uh, comedy docu series like this, uh, I do feel that it's only recently that it's it's been making kind of like a bit more of a crest. Um, and there's been like a large gap, right? Since like what was, I think it was after the Bruno movie that he took like a long break, right? Such a Cohen. Indeed, yes. Yeah, so we haven't really been getting that much of it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, uh, Ali G came out in, in 2000. Yeah. And I think part of the reason docu-comedy succeed is dependent on the era. In, er in extremely turbulent eras, yeah. I think this type of format to investigate real social issues uh, is, is, fru uh, is fruitful. 
mm-hmm. uh, more fruitful than actual documentary sometimes, you know? Yeah. Uh, much in the same way that like uh, edutainment shows like um, Last Week Tonight or The Daily Show, you know? Uh, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, they kind of come to prominence in turbulent eras uh, as a way to investigate human nature in a comedic way that allows you some relief from yeah. the darkness of the issues being explored. Yeah. But there is a certain mean-spiritedness to the Ali G show and, and, and <laughs> Sasha Baron, Baron Cohen's character that isn't quite present in, in today's uh, docu-comedies yep. uh, or, or present in a much smaller extent. Uh. Mm-hmm. Um, we'll be talking about our main topic, Nathan for You, uh, <laughs> which is in itself has become kind of a cult classic. Uh, subsequently, we'll be talking about How To with John Wilson, which aired last year on HBO, also produced by Nathan Fielder, um, funnily enough. But Nathan had a... N- close to no input into the show. It was all yep. John Wilson's thing. Mm-hmm. And we'll be talking about Netflix's Magic for Humans, Justin Wilson's comedy slash magic slash documentary show. Obstensibly, it's a magic show. Obstensibly, you know, on yeah. the surface. <laughs> but but he uses magic on, on real, like, like street magic, you know, like David Blaine, yeah. uh, on, on, on real people, not as a way to shock and awe them, but as a way to do social experiments on what people might do given certain circumstances, which, mm-hmm. you know, in itself is uh, quite informi- informative. Yeah. Um, but let's begin with Nathan For You, which, yeah. man, I, I've been a big fan of this show for, for a long time, since the early 2010s, since, since it came out, you know, since season one. Yeah. OG fan, but uh, you only recently caught Nathan For You. Um, to the best of your ability, um, give us a premise and what you thought about it. Like, oh, what, like a, as a first impression, what do you think <laughs> of it? Yeah. So, um... The premise of the story, right, centers around Nathan, who is a graduate from a business school. Uh, he apparently with good a, grades. With good <laughs> grades, yeah, with good grades, and uh, he has Mostly made it. Bees, uh. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess so. I'm not really sure what Canada's uh, no, like, grading system is like. They, they, they cut to his report card. Right? They're all like B's and C's. <laughs> yeah. Um. So he he has come up with with a show. Um. And where he basically wants to use his. Uh, great business acumen and insight in order to help struggling small businesses. Mm-hmm. Uh, it starts out that way, right, in season one. And, and by and large, for all, all the four seasons, it does carry on with that particular format. Uh, yeah. But it also becomes this uh, ridiculous kind of exploration into um, problem-solving for the human condition, if I could put it yeah. in, in, in any other way, right? Uh, it is extremely cringy. It is extremely funny. Uh, mm-hmm. The responses are very visceral and very real. Uh, there are moments in time where it's altogether uh, offensive without meaning to be, mm-hmm. um, especially for the people who are involved in that. Yep. And he kind of skirts this line between, you know, um, this whole idea of wanting to examine the social issues in a particular uh, uh, Adventure, let's just put it that way. Yeah. Uh, or, um, and, and having a very sat- satirical look at, you know, um, um, the state of society where it is right now. Specifically uh, with regards to capitalism. Uh, yes. Being, you know, business ideas, right? Yeah. yeah. I think spe- I, uh, there's a lot more heavy emphasis on that in some seasons than others. I think, like, mm-hmm. you know, later on when he does, like, the hero thing. Yeah. As well, um, you kind of move into more, like, social settings as, uh, as a result of that. Mm-hmm. Um, so it becomes a very in- fascinating platform, right? The 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 conceit of the show becomes a interesting look into uh, human nature and the way that we interact with both others and and uh, uh, economics and finances, mm-hmm. um, and and just this whole idea about like you know business and what makes good business ideas. Uh. Mm. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I think like Fielder, who plays this loose, fictionalized version of himself, very yeah. awkward, not too far away from the real Nathan Fielder at all. <laughs> in, in fact, the line is very blurry. Mm-hmm. And, and he convinces real, like these are real struggling small business owners to employ his bonkers marketing stunts, yep. you know, his often meandering, often humiliating plans. Like they, they usually require a business owner who is unaware of Nathan For You's comedic premise, obviously. You know? yep. They take it seriously to, to surrender some part of their integrity and enter this realm of just abject absurdity, right? Mm-hmm. You know? You know, um it's 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 bizarre, uh, you know, uh, and also can initially 
feel mean spirited or even cruel. Yeah. Uh, but it doesn't end up that way, and and mm-hmm. that's the beauty of Nathan for you. Yeah, yeah. I I mean, it's surprising, right? Given how out on a limb some of these ideas are and some of these proposals are, how yeah. often he is successful in what he's trying to do, mm-hmm. right? Like, um. Obviously, the yardstick for success is vastly different uh, mm-hmm. from the people who are be- who are involved in these schemes. Mm. Uh, but what he sets out to do, by and large, right, I would say like a good seventy percent of the time he manages to do, right. Mm-hmm. Whether it's like you know, oh, you you run a coffee shop business, I'm gonna help you get like you know more more um, people to come and try your your strange flavored yogurt, like all of these things. No matter how ridiculous and absurd they are, on some mm-hmm. level there is a very good insight to how. It how how it works, right? The, either the industry works or uh, how like these little, little parts of uh, wheels and cogs of uh, capitalism work. Um, mm-hmm. Whether or not that success is translated into something that's actually meaningful for the people that he's trying to help is a whole different thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah in- indeed. You know, like I think to a certain extent, Nathan um, appears to kind of ex- exploit his subjects politeness mm. um and and at its core i think even for you relies on discomfort for laughs right yeah. um yeah. the show as a result delivers this kind of almost moral ambiguity i i often found myself asking questions like should i really be, be watching this <laughs> is this is this gross you know so so yeah. the question of the show's moral efficacy like encouraged us to become hyper aware of our relegated roles as kind of complicit spectators la, in, yep. in, in a reality TV form that has uh, built this audience that way. But unlike most of that, Nathan For You challenged us. It never let us off the hook. It didn't go down easily. And at the end of the day, it encouraged us to find empathy with each and every one of its subjects as ludicrous as they are, uh, you know, or as uh, ignorant as they are. You know, the, the show's ability to transcend this like spine-crawling, Almost mm-hmm. dehumanizing narrative, uh, like it kind of establishes its own unique presence in in our media media landscape. I guess I think yeah. I think and crucially also Fielder, like he intertwines himself in the show schemes. You know, mm-hmm. yes, he exposes business owners and and uh, the structural uh, integrities of those business, but he also foregrounds it with his own vulnerability, his own loneliness, and his own inner turmoil. Yeah. kind of resulting in this quiet yet deeply felt uh, humanity across many episodes you know his openness leads others to share their own personal upheaval you know and, mm-hmm. and i guess one of the most famous episodes the the guest gas station <laughs> caricature artist episode i think yeah. fielder convinces a gas station owner to offer gas for a colossally low one dollar 75 cents per gallon with rebate the, the one caveat though is that patrons have to hike up to the top of a mountain and answer a series of riddles uh, to to deposit the rebate, right? Yeah, and and, and of course, several cheapskates join Fielder, hike up the mountain, <laughs> and a few of them even camp there overnight. And the mm. episode hilariously shows the lengths people will go to to save eleven dollars, but also displays a need, uh, an intrinsic need for human intimacy. You know, the mm-hmm. the lonely rebate campers and Fielder begin as strangers, but as day and night progresses, they they lament, they exchange personal stories with each other, they yeah. share a warm campfire and painfully play spin the bottle. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, and after the overnight, Fielder admits to the group that the pursuit of the rebate will never end. And yeah. they all simply laugh in response. You know, one camper even responds, you know, the friendship we gain here is just incredible. So it's episodes like that wherein the plot goes in unexpected places and unveils a potent vulnerability amongst its subjects and its star, Nathan Fielder himself. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it's, it's where the show is at its strongest. Like, in, in these cases, like our laughs of mockery and condescension, they transform into laughs of surprising, genuine delight and recognition and human empathy yeah. uh, that are organic. And, and, and while the premises may feel calculated and cold, there's always plenty of room for spontaneity and empathy <laughs> in all of his plans, you know? Yeah, yeah. Definitely. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a spectacularly empathetic show. Yes, I totally agree. I, I love that particular episode. Um, mm-hmm. But I mean, like earlier to your point, right, this whole idea of like Nathan inserting himself yeah. Uh, the one where he, um, the he, that one hero episode where he plays Corey. Yeah. Um, you know, so the premise of the story basically is that he he wants to turn like ordinary humans into superheroes, right? Like uh, kind of like a strange kind of branding exercises where he, uh, does the whole makeup thing and he imitates this particular person and goes about their life, uh, in mm-hmm. order to pull off a, a stunt of some kind. Um, you know, but that whole scene in the bar where he he's just like, oh, you know, uh, suddenly. 
um, wearing somebody else's face, like all all my insecurities fall away, right? Mm-hmm. And like going through the entire thing, like and it's like moments like that. I feel that are, are special, right? About Nathan for you, that's not something that we're gonna get on the Ali G show ne- necessarily. Mm-hmm. Um, that kind of like very deep personal insights. Um, that he is at once serious about, but at the same time, you're not sure if you can take it at its face value because you do know that you are watching a show after all. Mm-hmm. Um, like moments like that. Um. Uh, some very important kind of like human issues at the forefront and make you think about it uh, while at the same time feeling incredibly authentic and real at the same time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I I think Nathan For You has an important message about about the dehumanization of reality television and what it's become. Yeah. It's a bit of a satire of that also. And also has this message about skill and one-upsmanship for entertainment, you know, mm-hmm. as, as, as a desperate world finds new ways to snack, snack attention, uh, whether it's, you know, um, social media celebrities or whatnot, you know. Like, um, a lot of his plans are massive undertakings. <laughs> but they have very, very human, humanistic cores, um, it, in it, like you know, like yeah. uh, what what are, what were some of your favorite like schemes or episodes from from the show? Uh, I definitely liked the weight loss one. The weight loss one was ridiculously funny. Yeah. Oh, uh, the, um, the shame where, base. Yeah. Yeah, where he got people to carry furniture around for a moving company. Oh yeah, I like that. <laughs> that was yeah. pretty good. Uh, I think those were funny. I think the Starbucks one kind of took me by surprise. Yeah, uh, dumb Starbucks was actually like quite a social me. Uh, one one of the original viral things that came out of the show. Yeah, dumb uh, dumb Starbucks. Dumb Starbucks. Um, yeah. I I think it's very interesting, like the way that he did. Um, uh, was it the petting zoo one? Right, the mm. whole idea of the nature of virality. Yeah. Uh, you know, and like constructing viral kind of videos and things like that. Like that, uh, kind of stood out to me as well. Um, wow. I mean, like, there's a lot of good stuff to kind of pick from from from. Uh, four years of uh, mm. four seasons of that. In, uh, in in season one, there was an episode that broke format. Uh, it's called the Claw Shame, where Nathan oh, yeah. performs <laughs> a daring escape, where where he risks a fate that is uh, that is truly worse than death. Uh, yeah. where, where he he sets himself up as an escape artist, a magician who is trying to escape this convoluted trick so that he doesn't expose himself to a bunch of children. Yeah. Um, it's a phenomenally funny episode. Yeah, that was really like I I okay, I was sitting at the edge of my seat while watching that. Mm-hmm. Right? Like I'm still like still like it's it's a pretty fucked up way uh, yeah. to bet your life on, right? Like seriously, hey. like who in the world thinks of something like that? Uh, his interaction with the judge in particular was just like, are you serious? Mm-hmm. You know, <laughs> just what? Like what in the world is going on? Yeah. Uh, yeah, the souvenir shop one was pretty funny. Uh, yeah, it was yeah. as well. I I think like that and the whole idea of having to shoot the film and then make the festival. <laughs> yeah, was just like out of this world. Um, yeah, I mean, like some of these were really really good. Those are for me kind of some of the more standout ones. Um, mm-hmm. what's the one with the smoking and and the bar? The the, the smokers era the smokers era episode. There there were two of them actually. It it was it had a sequel. Uh, I, okay. So I'm talking about the the first one in particular. Like I think it's right, right. Smokers allowed, right? Yeah, smokers uh, allowed. Yeah, smokers allowed. Like that whole idea, right? Of of like turning uh, turning in a, uh, a bar into a theater so people can smoke there and then having an audience there just to view it mm-hmm. is really quite like crazy. Um, the fact is is that that is a high likelihood that people would pay money to watch that, right? Indeed. Like, that, that episode was pure experimental theatre, you know? Yeah. Like, Nathan, for that episode, Nathan Fielder should be mentioned alongside, like, Marina Abramovich or some shit, you know, as, yeah. as, a, as a conceptual artist of, of utter genius. Yeah, I mean, like, that completely blew me away, right? Like, the, the, the original premise of it was so... I mean, okay, sure. Like, you know, you want to skirt smoking laws and all that, you turn it into a theatre. Something that we can't do in Singapore, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. Um, but, like, for it to become actual theatre, like, the moment the audience is included and then you kind of, like, start challenging your ideas of what improvisational theatre actually is, what is the yeah. audience, who is the actor, like, there, like, it's the entire... That episode in and of itself would be something I would show to a theatre class to kind of question the nature of what, what we perceive theatre to be. Right, mm-hmm. and uh, that like kind of blew my mind, right? Given that I, 
I don't know how much of that was intentional mm -hmm. uh, to, to question the nature of theatre in his little scheme uh, mm -hmm. to help out this bar, bar owner. But man, I, I really did think that episode was really funny. Uh, it, it was more funny in the first half, I, I feel. Yeah. Um, and as, sad in the second half. And sad in the second half, yeah. Because yeah. it was, I mean, like the reproduction of that, the restaging of that didn't really quite have the same kind of like gravitas to it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think one of the episodes that a lot of people look to as Nathan for you's kind of like grand magnum opus of, of what it is, you know, the culmination of the show, yeah. was season four's uh, 90 minute finale called Finding Francis, mm -hmm. uh, which deviates from, I think, familiar narrative beats and acts as, a, as an epic coda to the series. You know, in the episode, Fyodor helps um, a Bill Gates impersonator, uh, Bill Heath, uh, reconnects with an old flame. And Fyodor imbues this, this really movie-length, feature-length episode with, yeah. with his signature absurdity and cringy humor. But more critically, the episode examines loss and regret and infidelity and loneliness from the perspective of both the subject, uh, Heath, and of Nathan Fyodor himself. You know, it, it, it functions as not just a docu-comedy, but a wholeheartedly riveting drama that evokes Nathan for you's getting greater strength, you know, mm -hmm. which is considering the ramifications of human relationships yeah. when, when documented on reality TV. It's a perfect swan song for, I guess, one of the strangest shows and, and <laughs> one of the most remarkable shows I've ever seen, you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I really, really love that episode. I do feel like it ran a little long mm -hmm. um, just because, like, it is so far out from anything else that Nathan for you has given us. Mm -hmm. uh, that there were just moments in time just like, oh, wow, this is like, this is a whole different thing, you know? Like, mm -hmm. you, you still have Nathan there, you still got all kind of the hallmarks of the show, but at the same time, like, what is examining in such depth was really, uh, it was a bit of a spin that took a bit getting used to. Mm, definitely, yeah. But but it, it continues on the, this line that the show has done, you know. Like, mm -hmm. I think, no doubt that I think some of Fyodor's interactions with business owners he helps are in character, of course, but yeah. there's this constant threat throughout the show's seasons that, you know, of this of this TV host who has, I think, a simple desire for human affection. Yeah. You know, it, it sometimes plays out in lingering hugs or awkward meetup plans or a few extra readings of the line, I love you. Yeah. Um, and, 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 you know, like, it's like Nathan for you could have done a more straightforward parody of The Bachelor, but I think by shepherding one person's quest for companionship in the middle of all these bizarre antics mm -hmm. just make the subtext out of the text, uh, so much more um, <laughs> potent, right? You know, yeah. uh, rather rather than just parodying a, a disposable dating show, you know, mm -hmm. um, and and whether you can discuss a reality show being truly real seems like a fruitless exercise, which is what Nathan for you is trying to show, also, you know. Yeah, agreed, agreed. Yeah, yeah. man, um, this was, uh, it, it seems mean spirited at first, but Nathan for you ends up being, I think, one of TV's true exercises in altruism and, and empathy. Mm -hmm. I think it's because the subjects don't become legendary by being laughing stocks. If if there are any villains on Nathan for you, it's the people who don't come across as genuine. Do you, you know what I mean? You know? Yeah. 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 It's 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 great. You know, uh, Nathan for you came across uh I think before the in I mean the internet was around at that time for sure, you know. Um mm -hmm. a lot of his schemes became viral. But you know like this seems like a show that seems made for today and a bit ahead of its time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, man. No. Uh, and any other thoughts about uh, Nathan for you? Uh, I mean, like, overall, like, having only recently caught onto it, right? Like, um, for in particular for us to, to um, recommend it and, like, binging that in a fairly short amount of time, you can kind of see, like, the whole growth arc of the show itself, right? Like, it starts off with a very simple, very silly premise, but it becomes so much more, you know, mm -hmm. uh, as it goes along. Like, it becomes more ambitious. It becomes a bit more detailed in terms of the story that it wants to tell, you know. Um, and it is... It, it graduates at some point from cringe comedy yeah, into wildly brilliant satire, right? Mm -hmm. and, there's, and you don't realize it until you're almost done. Uh, with with four seasons of it, right? And I think that to me is is why I would make this a standout recommendation for a comedy docu series. Yeah, yeah, uh, definitely. Uh, Nathan Fielder is is the genius in this field. Similarly, uh, for HBO, he has <laughs> produced a different show, uh, hosted by one documentarian, 
John Wilson, who is not at all unlike Nathan Fielder, actually. Uh, it kind of explains why they are friends. Um, yeah. The show is called How To With John Wilson, one of my favorite discoveries of 2020. <laughs> like last year when I was like crafting, uh, you know, like the, the best of the year uh, yeah. recommendations, both for Behold and for Portwire, um, I struggled with how to categorize how to John Wilson, where to put it, because we were so weird and so small scale. Uh, mm-hmm. But at the same time, like for pound for pound, minute for minute of sheer, sheer delight, right? Nothing delighted me more on anything else on TV than How To With John Wilson. Um, it, it, it's, have, have you ever read a book called um, If You Give a Mouse a Cookie? Uh, no, I don't, I don't think I have. Okay, it's, it's a children's book by Laura Numeroff. So each book, it follows an animal along a series of uh, random adventures, you know, where uh-huh. one thing leads to another. So for example, um, you know, um, uh, uh, a cookie that the mouse eats makes him thirsty for milk. And then it leads him to another, an- another point where the milk prompts him to check his reflection to see if he has a milk mustache. And then another point, and then he realizes that his whiskers need a trim. And then he goes to a barber and then and so on and so on and so on, right? Mm-hmm. It comes to the point, right? Like at the end of the thing, it's like, how did we get here, you know? Like, <laughs> and, 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 and if you give a mouse a cookie, is what How To With John Wilson re- reminds me of. Um, how To With John Wilson is essentially a parody docu-comedy about this kind of authorial how-to shows, you know, like yeah. where, where people give advice, you know, uh, but with how-to, John Wilson is for the most mundane things. Mm-hmm. How to how to make small talk, um, you know, uh, how to build scaffolding, how to make uh, the perfect pot of risotto, yeah. how to cover your furniture, you know, um, and, and it is so bizarre and it digresses in so many weird ways mm-hmm. that, that it, it perpetually catches me by surprise every episode you know um what what do you what do you think of uh, how to john wilson um I, I think reading up about it before i actually started watching everything i was i was uh, uh I, I kind of like the the premise right i thought okay okay this feels like it's gonna be a fun watch uh mm-hmm. where each individual episode ends up Right within the course of the episode itself, like I just kind of like blew my mind. I was like, seriously, like how in the world do you get from that to like you know circumcision? How do you get from that to like refs association, for example? Right, mm-hmm. uh, just to name a few, and it is so bizarre the situation that he situations that he eventually finds himself with that mm. are like comedy goal. Uh, yeah. but at no point in time do you ever have the impression that it's put on, right? Like, it's engineered or it's put on in mm-hmm. any way. And that, like, is so mind-blowing because the format is very different from Nathan for you, right? Like, this is largely uh, first-person POV, man mm-hmm. with camera, um, and, and, and that makes it feel, like, really a, a lot more personable. Uh, yeah. I feel, especially with the voiceovers and all of that, right? Like his little musings as he's going about, like putting together all mm-hmm. these very random shots mm. from his day to day life, uh, le- leaves a kind of poignancy that I did not expect uh, and thoroughly enjoyed from time to time. You know, you had like these small, quiet moments of reflection in a very kind of like often dry, cynical way. Uh, counterposed with like these interesting like fascinating images of city life in New York Uh, Mm. and then just the strange strange places and situations that he eventually finds himself in uh, make for a very weird mix that is thoroughly enjoyable to watch yeah I mean the premise like is the essential premise is like John Wilson is an anxious New Yorker who attempts to give everyday advice while dealing with his own personal issues Mm -hmm. it is Simple enough when you explain it in the elevator pitch, but yeah. in execution is so different. Oh yeah, yeah. The you execution know, like, it, it has all to do with the execution, really. Yeah, yeah. I mean, how to with John Wilson talks about you know making small talk or, or how to cover your furniture, and he seems focused on each task, genuinely focused in the beginning, yeah. but only for as long as it takes his attention to wander to someone he meets along the way. Yeah. Um, like for example, when he braves you know a Meadowlands Park during a during WrestleMania to, to, <laughs> to, to practice his small talk skills, for example, which leads to one of the best wrestling jokes I've ever heard. You know, uh, where, where do you see the future of mankind? <laughs> yeah. uh, it, fantastic. Uh, mankind, obviously, a, a famous pro wrestler, Mick Foley. Um, you know, he, he, and he asks one tailgater 
what does he do for a living, right? When, yeah. when asking, <laughs> then he says, I catch child predators. The man replies, you know. And, and soon we're in his house. And the fact that he allows Wilson to film him on an attempted, attempted sting to catch a child predator is bizarre. And then this leads him to a vacation in Cancun because what small talk topic is safer than your recent vacation, you know? Mm-hmm. So at the resort, it turns out to be hosting MTV's spring break coverage. <laughs> and and this, this is agony for an introvert like Wilson, right? Yeah. You know? um, it's, and, and then from there, it goes on and on and on. And, and even the Cancun interlude uh, finds a small moment of shared humanity mm-hmm. when he has a conversation with one of the spring breakers, you know? Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know, um, uh, this is in the first episode even, like this was a person I instantly judged because of his horrible freestyle that yeah. he did mm-hmm. in the first episode. Like I don't, I don't know, people, but genuinely one of the one of the worst freestyles I've ever heard. This white guy, and then when you sit down with him and you kind of hear why he's at spring break, yeah, you know, what his what his internal turmoil is. You know, everybody has a story. Everybody has yeah has his struggles, right? It 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 taught me perhaps I shouldn't be judging people uh, just on surface, on on surface value. You know? mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, it, yeah, and then you go from that, and then like, uh, there are just these. Um, let's take a moment to talk about some of the songs that appear in this series. Yeah, yeah. Oh God, um, the yeah, the foreskin one. Yeah. Uh, it's just like what in the world, and I just, I don't know. It's very hard to describe. If you, mm. if it's very hard to share with someone exactly what the experience of watching How to is, mm-hmm. um. Without them having having seen it before, right? And mm-hmm. like it, it is moments like that where, you know, I was just like making my notes for for this particular topic, and I'm just like, okay, right? You can explain the premise, but you can't explain the experience necessarily, right? Just because like it's one of those things where you're just like, huh, what? Mm. It 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 it's like you suffer from whiplash almost, right? Because like out of the blue, you go into this place where you're like, okay, right? Um. It the that's the cover was it the cover one where we also go into like the whole foreskin thing as well how to cover your furniture yeah that's the episode right yeah 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 so it goes like, from, how, how do we get from there yeah. to him discussing parasite with a guy with his cock out on his bed right yeah right yeah and like I'm just like uh that completely stunned me like the 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 frontal nudity as well I was just like what yeah uh, and then yeah. you go from that and then there's like a completely like original song to go along with that. And if you're it, wondering what the intro song for today's episode is, it is the Fork- Foreskin song from this episode. If you've seen it, you know it. It's great. Yeah, it's amazing. Uh, we, <laughs> yeah, it, it is so, so, so bizarre. And it makes you feel so many things. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think it culminates um, the, the epitome of, 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 of the mix of feelings that you had culminates in the last episode. Which yeah. dovetails with uh, the start COVID of the, hitting, the pandemic. Uh, yeah, COVID hitting New York. You know, like the show itself. At first, you know, is this achingly gorgeous love letter to New York. Mm-hmm. Um, New York. If you've never been there, New York is bizarre. It is one of the <laughs> weirdest places you've ever seen. When you look at the bureau footage that, that that John Wilson covers, right? You know, the random things that that he finds that yeah. doctors are doing. That you can see that every day at every corner of every street. That is New York, you know. It's an achingly gorgeous love letter to what I remember of New York like, for my visits there, and of course to New Yorkers. Like. Mm-hmm. And then the fact that it, the final episode also covers New York in the in the in the throes of COVID in the beginning, you know, how the city is ground to the halt. Yeah. Um. And and, and perhaps irrevocably transformed. You know, it's sad, right? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. But like in the midst of all of that, right? Um, mm-hmm. his little obsession with trying to make you know, the perfect risotto um, and how that quest mm. bleeds into the isolation of, of of having to be in during the pandemic, right? Mm-hmm. And and just this yearning to, as, as he puts it, right, eat together again. Like, oh, it's so brilliant. It's so brilliant. Like, the way that that flows one into another and it is uh, indicative of the brilliance that you see in every episode. Yeah. Um, yeah, but like nothing kind of like captures that more than um, episode six, the the final episode. Yeah, um, I think how to John Wilson is a show that benefits enormously from devoting your full attention to it. This is not one of those shows where you can like you you, you can watch while you're responding to an email or something. You know. Yeah, you, you really got to pay attention. You know, because uh, I think 
like Wilson has taken the familiar concept of B-roll footage, right? You know, mm-hmm. establishing shot, establishing shots of buildings, neighborhoods, men and women on the street, etc. Yep. And he has turned it B-roll footage into the best, funniest, and most um potent, uh, insightful parts of the series. Yeah, absolutely. The, the, choice, the choices he and his editors make, uh, alongside his co-writers, make in terms of what images to accompany his transitions, the, the double entendres in each image, <laughs> uh, how, how the two complement one another, is both masterful and hilarious. And it speaks to the, to the meticulous, seemi- like this is a seemingly very like um, scraggy show, you know, like very scruffy. Oh, yeah. It's not. It's not. It's not. The fact that the, the footage has been edited this way, that, that has been cut this way, and, and you know, he finds the perfect moments for some bizarre shots, just shows how much thought goes into it, you know? It's insane, right? Yeah. Like, I cannot imagine how much you have to shoot in order to get that kind of quality B-roll stuff. Yeah. Right? For every thought and for every uh, few sentences that leaves his mouth, right, he has the perfect shot for it. Mm. Uh, how much do you have to be filming around in the city in order to be able to capture that, right? Like, it's kind of nuts to think about. Uh, yeah. And yeah, you're abs- I, I attempted to put this in the background and, and, and kind of do work at the same time. Mm. Um, 10 minutes into the first episode, I'm just like, no, like I can't do this. Like, I need to set aside time for this because I'm missing so much, right? Like, mm. sure, I can listen to the narration and all of that, but like, there's plenty more visually that it is saying that I am missing out on if I'm not giving it my, my 100%. Yeah, indeed, you know, like, I think the candid moments that he captures in New York is either the result of this, of his ungodly amount of, I think, meticulous and compulsive documenting, yeah. which is true. Mm-hmm. Like, John Wilson does admit that he is a compulsive documentarian, you know, he lives behind the camera. Yeah. But it, it also says a lot to his sharp eye for the kind of off-kilter curiosities mm-hmm. that make for an undeniably satisfying visual joke. Yeah. Uh, and then some seem innocuously pedestrian you know, the pedestrian <laughs> activity like film from across the block and then it suddenly becomes this magician level misdirect into some other bit of information that pops into frame right yeah it, it's brilliant stuff you know and, and like much of the show is done without malice and it's done with a lot of inst- a lot of profound insight into humanity you know the, mm-hmm. the first mm-hmm. and last episodes really showcase that even the episode that you're talking about how to cover your furniture right like yeah. he, he's talking to that real estate agent at the end you know um and then she points out that uh wilson is covering himself too behind the camera it's it's a way for him to interact with people and yet not interact with the world yeah right? that was like uh that was such great insight mm-hmm. um yeah it was just kind of like strange i think especially for like how to cover your furniture mm-hmm. uh this whole idea like it bordered into like ship of Theseus territory, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Like near the end over there, like I was just like, what in the world? Like, how do you even begin? Uh, um, like, how do you frame it so well, right? Like, essentially, the argument is ship of Theseus. Mm-hmm. Uh, which for those of you who haven't caught on Wonder Vision, please go and watch episode nine. Uh, it will blow your mind, and then mm-hmm. you can go Google about what ship of Theseus actually is. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you. You look at okay the discussion, uh, the underlying issue is ship of Theseus. That that's the that's the philosophy behind what they're trying to discuss. The discussion has absolutely nothing to do with it at all. But it's framed yeah. in such a way that even if you had no idea what that um that that uh thought experiment actually is, right? Mm-hmm. By the time you're done with the episode, you uh, you absolutely have a grasp of what it's about, and that's like it's so in- insanely good. Uh, the way in which that gets packed and or, or unpacked for us um, in the most normal and sometimes extremely banal way. Yeah. Yeah, indeed, you know. Um, one of my favorite episodes is How to Improve Your Memory mm. um, where he goes, well, it starts with him, you know, just trying to improve his memory and then he goes into this deep hole of um, what, what do you call that? The, the Mandela um, effects, right? Yeah, the Mandela effects. So, uh, best in best. Uh, yeah, yeah. The, yeah, yeah, the, Be- the best in best and all. Yeah, yeah. So it it in it, it becomes this whole exploration to examine why the world seems increasingly inhospitable to basic reasoning, mm-hmm. and it it actually offers one of the best explanations to QAnon I've seen, you know, yep. on 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 anything, you know, it really explains QAnon. Uh, and, and and although Wilson is rarely visible, the show is in many ways a reflection of his own difficulty of navigating this weird world like, with his trusty camera as his, as his uh, shield, uh, shall we yeah. say. Mm, yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, my personal favorite is how to split a check. 
I yeah, think. yeah, yeah. That's my yeah. personal favorite. Like, because uh, I mean, honestly, it is such a it is a it is a challenge, right? Like, even with the apps that we have nowadays that are supposed to like automate all of that, of which mm-hmm. uh, our own friend group we've tried a few. Uh, we mm-hmm. have some uh, we have some special humans in our group who also are able to do that manually mm-hmm. um, by some gift of of, of uh, God. <clears throat> yeah, but such a very like being a mundane kind of like problem uh, becomes this strange uh, journey into what's fair and what's not uh, mm-hmm. you know and like if who is the arbiter for what what is is um, fair and good right and just the whole thing with the referees association was bizarre to know and... the gold watch that got stolen at the end oh yeah. my god <laughs> I was just like are you serious <laughs> like um, uh, just how did he get to the referee shop, and then from there get invited to this dinner, like yeah. it just blows my mind, right? And then to to be able to capture that kind of behavior, yeah, is insane. Like yeah. how it is like it, this is peak documentary making, right? Yeah. Don't we don't even need to talk about like comedy docu series. Just the way that he mines material or he mm-hmm. stumbles into them is uh, is mm-hmm. so good, it's so good. Yeah, you know, I think like out of context, you know, some of the ways that this, these episodes uh, and, and topics connect to kind of wider reaching metaphors, I think may seem saturine or false, but in the hands of Wilson, right, there's an earned earnestness to how all of this plays out. Yeah. There's a certain strain of, you know, comforting self-awareness as as uh, the show kind of connects the dots to those heartfelt conclusions. Yeah. The only way that, you know, John Wilson knows how. It, yeah. it follows wherever its its twists and turns go, without making those who flit in and out of the series the punchline, you know? Mm-hmm. It, it's a show that genuinely feels like it's figuring things out as it goes along. Yeah. The classic case of never of documentary filmmaking never, you know, setting out an agenda. He just follows mm-hmm. wherever it goes. And yeah. in this particular case, that's that's the best case scenario for what you could possibly want from a show like this. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. I, I think a lot of it, has to do uh, a lot of how relatable and how genuine this series feels has to do with um, Nathan's narration. No, not Nathan's uh, narration. John's, John's narration. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, at, at any given point in time, when we as an audience encounter a uncomfortable situation, of which there are plenty mm-hmm. in this particular series, right? Uh, you can hear it in the way that he speaks, the way he and talks. Like he wants to be polite. He is cognizant of the fact that, you know, at the end of the day, he has to make the show, uh, but it's also a very uncomfortable situation for a kind of like man you just met for the first time to whip out his dick. Uh, yeah. And it's palpable in the way that he speaks and in the sound of his voice. And that uh, helps us as an audience who is also uncomfortable to relate to him in that particular situation, mm. uh, which only makes his insights into what's going on um so genuine yeah oh my god like yeah so good so yeah good. one of my favorite low-key discoveries of last year um i i, I recommended a lot of good new shows last year uh-huh. how to how to with john wilson is one of them i can't believe the joy when i stumbled <laughs> uh, across this show on on hbo you know, I this wasn't on my radar at all. I had no hype for it. You know, there was no trailer that made me like, oh, let's check this out. Yeah. You know, I just stumbled across it one day and I was just so taken aback by how good it was. I'm, um, I'm, I'm glad you did, man, because I had a ton of fun watching this. Uh, and yeah. It, it, it gives you a lot to chew on, you know, but without like any of the kind of like jarring heaviness of that, right? Like this, uh, some of this insanity is part of life and, you know, you take it as it comes, lah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Similarly, uh, on Netflix, there's a different show called Magic for Humans. Uh, and it's kind of this charming magic showcase that is kind of built like an all ages sketch comedy show slash yeah. documentarian, uh, social experimenting. Uh, it's led by a guy called Justin Wilman, who is a comedian slash magician. Mm-hmm. That he really is both. He is both, and he leads this kind of unscripted look into people's relationship to magic that is part. Nathan Fielder and part Bill Nye, um, <laughs> and and it's it's so great. It's it's one of my favorite uh things on Netflix that I think a lot of people don't watch and 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 uh and don't realize that it's very good. Even even though one of its tricks in in season one actually became a viral meme. 
Yeah. Um, but before we delve into all that, you know, like uh, you, you've been watching uh, Magic for Humans uh, since the beginning. Uh, give us a little premise uh, about what it is. Um, yeah, I think you've pretty much got it down, right? Like uh, I randomly discovered Magic for Humans. I, I saw its trailer um, on Netflix when season one came out in, mm-hmm. what was it, 2018 maybe? Yeah. Uh, you know, and I thought, okay, like this seems like a simple kind of breezy watch to eat while I'm having a snack or having a meal uh, in front of the TV. Mm-hmm. And uh, what I didn't expect, uh, I was expecting like, okay, you know, like it's going to be a funny take on like David Blaine or like, you know, Chris Angel, the stuff that we used to get in the early knots, right? Yeah. Uh, as far as like street magicians go, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, but what I didn't expect was the commentary that came along with it and the situations that he sets up uh, with mm-hmm. the different premises from episode to episode or uh, season to season for that matter. Uh, mm-hmm. And I was... Go- I, I became very taken with the way that he went about exploring these things uh, mm. because at the center of it all like it is a, a magic sketch show um, yep. but the things that get revealed are not I, they, they aren't always like this incredibly like deep insights right but it does pose a lot of questions to what you think you may necessarily know about situations that mm-hmm. you might be put in or situations that feel orchestrated mm-hmm. Uh so yeah, um, yeah. Essentially, that's it. Uh, it's all like these little, little. Uh, every episode has a theme, and then he goes about like just trying to set up situations uh, which allow him to interact with real people, uh, mm-hmm. true magic. Uh, some of them seem a bit far fetched, right? Like, like he really does go out of the way to set up, um, the premise for that. Um, mm-hmm. but others are a lot more simple. Um, and uh. They're just these little moments that they manage to capture, especially like reactions uh, from mm. the audience members that are very different, right? Like it's not exaggerated, like, you know, with Chris Angel and everybody's like screaming their heads off, you know? Yeah. And and all of that. And they're running around. It's like, oh my, oh my God, what happened? What happened? Like there's some really, really like uh, visceral like reactions from people that, uh, you know, I just like you and me. Yeah. Yeah. What are some of your favorite like episodes for for Magic for Humans? I mean, clearly we can't talk about Magic for Humans without talking about its most viral episode. Yeah. Uh, seeing is believing, where Justin <laughs> attempts to convince people that they are invisible, which yeah. of course led to a bunch of people trying out this trick on their family members and friends. Yeah. And it became like this whole Facebook, Twitter, Instagram meme thing, you know, where where just different people try tried it out there. And and the thing that saddens me about that meme is that no one realizes where it's from. Yeah. And it's it's from this episode of Magic for Humans, uh, season one, episode four. Um essentially what he does is he attempts to convince regular passers by that he is a magician that can make you invisible. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So he makes you invisible. He shows you first a, a legit trick where uh, a person beside him becomes invisible and then he does it to him. Yeah. So he then when he does it to him, he receives a phone call. Uh, apparently important, urgent. He leaves the scene, uh, and he for- he forgets to revert the invisible person visible. You know, yeah. he's still invisible. So this lets you see a bit of a social experiment to let you see what people would do with this kind of power. Mm-hmm. There is one guy who just goes on a pure. Uh, he, <laughs> what I can only describe as an existential crisis yeah. as he as he freaks out about what he, what is he going to do now, you know? What, what am I going to do? I'm invisible. Hello, are you coming back, you know? He's just freaking out. It's a pure existential crisis. Who I am? What am I if no one can see me? Mm-hmm. And then there's a man- another person who goes power hungry. He just starts abusing his power. He starts knocking over like wine bottles and things, right? You know? yeah. yeah. What a great example. You know, this, this, this particular trick is a great encapsulation for what the show is. Yeah, I agree. I totally agree. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I really, really like that one. Uh, I, I can't remember which episode is the levitating one. Mm. Uh, that that one as well. Uh, yeah. But my all time favorite episode from the three seasons that we've gotten is the marshmallow one. I think that's self control. Yeah. Uh, that one, like, really, some of the kids in that in 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 um in that experiment were just like. The, the kid that cries because the marshmallow disappears I'm just like oh no mm. you poor thing you know uh, but still like so interesting such a fascinating kind of like um, spin on the Stanford marshmallow experiment 
think, <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, it's it's great because like a, a similar trick also involving kids that he does is when he asks his kids, uh, if if I'm a magician and I can conjure up anything ever, you know, what do you want for a present? So so a bunch of kids name some presents and you know like a PS4 or some shit and he conjures it up, right? Yep. And then he asks them like. You know, your mother has worked hard for you. You know, obviously you love your mom. Well, what kind of present would you want them to give? Mm-hmm. What, what, what would you want to give them? You know, some, says, uh, some say high heels and, and stuff like that. He conjures it up, you know, and, and he asks the kids, like, if you can only keep one, which will you keep? And most of the kids pick the presents for their moms, which yeah. is very, very sweet. Except for one, you know. <laughs> Um, the, the, their moms are in the other rooms watching this and all the other moms are like oh my kid my kid is so nice he, he got me the present instead of being selfish and keeping his own present you know how must that, that one mom feel right with that one selfish kid who's just like you know fuck my mom I'm keeping my, pre- I'm keeping my gifts yeah yeah that was, that, was a, that was a great episode yeah, yeah similarly with the social experiment right um, with the social media influences also where he influenced them to uh, he you know, influences think that they can influence people, mm-hmm. but then like he subconsciously <laughs> in- influences them to all do the same thing. Yeah. Um, it's very brilliant and it's also about the power of subliminal messaging, which yep. is great also. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Some of the NSP stuff that he does is like really the NLP stuff that he does is really quite like brilliant. Mm-hmm. Uh in the way that he goes about it. I also like um which is uh, I can't remember which episode it was, but like basically had to do it remotely because he was supposed to be looking after his kid. Ah, yeah, um, yeah. All Work and No Play, season 2, episode 5. Yeah. Uh, the tele- telecommunicating via a handy uh, task rabbit helper, right? Yeah, wow, I love that. That was like, it was it's simply brilliant just because mm-hmm. like, for you to pull off magic tricks like that without the magician being there in person, that's one thing, right? Mm-hmm. But like, it is very, very reflective of just the time that we're living in right now with everything being done remotely and, and all the telecommunications that are going on. Like, mm-hmm. how do you do street magic, like face-to-face street magic, uh, as a close-up magician when you're not there, right? Um, yeah. Another one of the highlights for me from this series. Oh, definitely, you know. Um, also, there was one episode where he talks about, I, I suppose with pre-recorded or staged, uh, you know, like stuff like this, like, like street magic that is filmed, right? Yeah. It's a bit hard to disassociate yourself from the idea that, you know, what if this is all staged? Mm-hmm. What if this is all fake? And he explores that in actually a particular episode called Fake, mm. where he attempts to set up a faked magic trick where he asks his audience, his the, the street, the, the street subjects uh, to, to react a particular way to a trick that they will do uh, with CGI later, you know? Yeah. And it, it, it so simply uh, elucidates <laughs> why that can't be done because none of these fuckers can act, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That was a, that was a good episode. It's so great. And then he actually pulls out a real magic trick and then he shows a real moment of spontaneous joy and gasping. You know, mm. that's the difference between asking a bunch of uh, normal people of the street to act and, de- and catching genuine reactions. Yeah. You know? It's so easy to see like what is fake and what is not, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, it's great. It's, it's, it's this, this is the kind of social experimentation and comedy that, that Justin Woman does so well. Mm-hmm. Um, which is why I think this is unlike any other magic show I've ever seen. Yeah, absolutely. I don't think anything kind of comes close. Uh, mm-hmm. I don't think we... This is the kind of magic show that we deserve, right? Like, sure, mm-hmm. back, back in the day, like what David Blaine does... Uh, Blew, blew people's minds, right? Just because, like, at that point in time, it was a genre of thing that was getting extremely popular. Mm-hmm. Uh, but to use magic to capture moments of human magic, right, yeah. is like, like I think, is the pinnacle of what the the genre should actually be. Yeah. Yeah, and, and similarly to a bit like a John Wilson and Ian from Fury, Justin Woman actually puts a lot of himself, uh, his own emotions, his own journey. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Into some of these episodes, particularly with the season finales, right? You know, yeah. where, where it feels hilarious and heartfelt, and he talks about how he became a magician and why uh-huh. he becomes a, and why he does the things that he does, you know. Um, it, it's really great stuff. It, it functions as both a social experiment, it functions as both of a character study on who Justin Woman is, and it is also just plain funny. He's a good comedian <laughs> and he's a good magician. You yeah. know, none of his tricks are like, you know, Copperfield level, make the Statue of Liberty disappear kind of stuff, like, you know. Yeah. But his tricks are done for a particular purpose with a particular insight in mind to the, yeah. to the broader overarching themes of that particular episode, which mm-hmm. are all very universal. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I love it. Uh, I, I like the fact that he doesn't take it too seriously. 
Uh, yeah. Overall, like I think like a lot of uh, what we under that yeah, so they yeah. take themselves very very seriously, and he doesn't take that uh, take it too seriously. Mm-hmm. Um, in particular, I think the IBM one where he tries to recruit new magicians. Yeah, uh, yeah, new people into being magicians, like all of that, like it's ridiculously um uh, insightful, but at the same time, you know, he's having a jab at himself and the whole idea of what it is to be a magician. Mm. And that is so vastly different from what we've gotten for such a long time. Mm. Um that it make it really does make um magic for humans stand out. And of course, like the different segments as well. Lah. Magic yeah. for Susan's is so funny. <laughs> Yeah, magic for Susan's. <laughs> and, and, they, and they got um, Susan Sarandon for one of them. Yeah, it was so... Oh, man, I burst out laughing when I saw that uh, that, that episode. Um, yeah, I was waiting for Susan Sarandon to pop up. I was just like, please, one day, one day. And, and finally it, got it in season three. It's so good. It's so funny. Yeah. Magic for Susan's is... is uh, uh, tricks, trick questions is bizarre. Yeah, yeah. Trick- that, that, that is the most non-sequitur bit of comedy that the show has. Yeah, it is absolutely like, huh? What in yeah. the world? Um, yeah. But like really um the just the way in which everything um pans out the way that it's formatted um the way he sets about like with a very kind of clear image of what he's trying to do in mind right mm-hmm. um and then these interesting ways of how he tries to get there much like john wilson mm-hmm. uh oh much unlike john wilson rather yeah. uh is refreshing and sim- a very simply enjoyable series yeah, uh, to me, and uh, yeah, highly recommend. Uh, it's not, I won't. I'm not gonna say like it's gonna be life changing or anything, but it mm. will like a, an episode a day will make your day. I I have to say that much. Indeed, you know, like uh, what you said really hit the nail on the head. Like um, Justin Roman doesn't take himself seriously. He's often self-deprecating. Mm. Uh, whereas you know you're used to see this uh, holier than thou, grandeur, uh, mystique of people like David Blaine and um. Darren Brown and uh, David Copperfield and all of this, you know, larger than life. Yeah. You know? and, and he doesn't approach it that way, you know. He doesn't think he's better. In fact, he feel he feels like magic is a tool to mm. learn more about people. Yeah. Uh, and and it's true, you know. Um, il- just like fiction, illusions can can reveal uh profound insights into people as well. Yeah. And then that, that's what like all these three shows have in common, also. And and I kind of like this whole like new um spin on magic like people are starting to get really experimental with uh magic show formats i don't know whether you've ever uh seen derek del gaudio's uh in and of itself Ooh, derek del gaudio no i have not okay um he is uh have you have you seen the net by the way by hannah gatsby yes i have yeah so like in of of itself is like the net but a magic show you know mm-hmm. it, it kind of blends like all inspiring magic with a deeply personal memoir that 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 comes through, uh, with it, it, it first started out as an off Broadway show, and then he he's turned it into a a, t- a special on Hulu lah. So it's ah, film. okay. Yeah, okay. so it's it's like a confessional one man play as a showcase for sleight of hand. You know, it mm-hmm. it kind of transforms the typical shock and awe of illusions into a very powerful meditation on existential yearning and his own bumpy quest for meaning in life, you know, mm-hmm. when when so much of his life is shrouded in secrecy and illusion, what is life? You know, what he doesn't know who he is anymore. Yeah. So it like the Delgado kind of uses his magic setup and tricks to dig deep into his own personal history. And then he crafts his tricks around autobiographical storytelling. Uh, and it kind of makes it like the most poignant magic show you ever see. It's it's the net of magic. La, and mm-hmm. much in the way that the net like um, uh, subverted or or reimagine what a comedy show can be. Yeah, uh, and and so that's in and of itself. It's it's very similar, and and you should check that out too. I know it's not part of the episode, but I thought I would recommend it since it's magic adjacent. Sure, actually, we can. Uh, I I'll go watch that, and then we can mm-hmm. put it into a different episode. Uh, mm-hmm. with Nanette and um, in and of itself, and uh, what's the other one? What's the one called where it's basically the guy doing a whole stand-up show just to his ex-girlfriend? Oh, yeah. Uh, it, it's not revealed to the end. Like, we think he is delivering a magic show to an empty audience, but the ex-girlfriend's at the end. Yeah. Ah, um, okay. I forgot what that was called, but yeah, we can do that too. Yeah, we can do that uh, for, for another episode. But cool. I'm definitely going to go check that out. That sounds like really interesting. A big fan of uh, the net. <clears throat> and I'm, mm-hmm. I'm curious to see how he would do that. Something similar with magic. Okay. Okay. 
Definitely. Uh, yeah, and that's it for this episode. Uh, next week we'll be back with a new episode of Behold, where we'll be, we'll talk. We are talking about films mm-hmm. that feature protagonists, creative protagonists that blur fiction and reality for the sake of their art form. You know. Yeah. Um, we discuss the films that examine the perils of blurring fiction and reality for art, and you know that is the the recursive meta writing of adaptation, mm-hmm. that is the emotional exploitation of the acting process in Madeline's Madeline, that is the deconstruction of the ego in Birdman, yeah. uh, and of course the disassociative identity of celebrity in Perfect Blue. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think these movies really um, smartly explore the rewards and costs of wrapping up real lives in perception and imagination. Yeah. Uh, good stuff, man. I, I can't wait to talk about it because a lot of these movies are quite meaty and some, mm. of, them are my, are, are some, some of them are my favorites of all time. Yeah, I think with any one of that, we could probably fill out an entire episode. Uh, yeah, it will be a bit of we. It will be a bit of a challenge to keep us on the rails for that. Uh, mm-hmm. But I'm excited. I'm excited. A lot of stuff to chew through. A lot of stuff to discuss. Uh, very, very excited. Of course, and if you're not listened to genre equality thirty nine, which was uh, our previous episode, we talk about Wonder Vision, Saint Maud. Isa is back with Anime Corner with a whole host of recommendations, mm. both new and old. Uh, I also have some quick hits, you know, uh, Little Fish, one of my favorite sci fi films this year. Yep. Talk about that a little bit as well. I talk about how I do not like the watch, Space Sweepers, Yearwick and the Witch, which is Studio Ghibli's first CG film. All of that can be found on our Facebook or Mixcloud at Genre Equality or you can find it on Singapore Community Radio. Uh, it's up on your Twitch and it's up on your Facebook Live right now so go check that out. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, till next time though, this has been Hit Zero. I'm Isa. Goodbye guys. Ciao.